Thank you, Pastor Eric, worship team, tech team. Hello, everyone. God bless you on this beautiful July morning. It's uh, warm, but I hope you're staying cool in your heart. <laughs> Had a beautiful week. This last weekend, we got to spend some time with our daughter and grandson, and that's always a wonderful time. It's all right. Guitar down. It's okay. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, on YouTube and on Facebook. We're glad you're joining us here at Rock of Hope. We hope that this ministry is a blessing to you. You know, we've been uh, looking since the beginning of this year, actually, at a series called Prophets, Priests, and Kings. And today, middle of July, we get to bring it to a close. So we've had a, a, a great joy in looking through the passages of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, the office of prophet in the New Testament and the Old Testament, the manifestation gift of prophecy, and uh, how that's uh, developed and used in the life of the church. And today I want to bring a close to the entire series by talking about you, the Christian. If you have given your life to Christ, you are redeemed, you confess Him as Lord, you're part of the family, you've been adopted in the family of God, and you are not Christ follower. You are new, a creation, alive in Christ where you were dead in sin. So now you're alive for the first time spiritually, and you're part of the family of God. You're called a Christian. Now, I'm highly aware that in our country, we have people who are known as cultural Christians. They're Christians singularly because they were born in America, a quote-unquote Christian country. This is true across the globe with many faiths. Born in Asia, you're assumed to be Buddhist potentially. Uh, born in India, you're assumed to be Hindu. Or in the uh, Middle East and Iran and such, you're assumed to be Muslim. And so we in America, we have a lot of cultural Christians who call themselves Christ followers, but they truly are not. They align themselves with the country, not the Savior. We have a lot of people, in fact, about 85% of the population claim that there is one God and Jesus is His Son. So they're creedal, they have this belief system that yes, there's God and yes, Christ is His Son, but that's as far as it goes. Well, the Bible says in James, even the devils know that. That doesn't save anybody. No one's in the family of God just because they believe there's a God and believe that Christ is His Son. That's not sufficient. That's just creedal and the demons know it to be true as well. So when you actually come into the family of God where you're part of the congregation of God, it's when your heart cries out to God, He draws you to Himself, you're convicted of your sins, and you give yourselves completely to Christ as His servant, as His follower. You follow His teachings. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. He's your all in all. In the future, He will be your bridegroom. It's a different gig than going to church. It's a different gig than just being an American or holding to a belief. You are walking with the Savior. Now, the Bible says when you do this, your body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. Everywhere you go, the temple of God is moving. And the temple of God is indwelled with the Spirit of God. So everywhere you go as a believer in Christ, you are the temple moving everywhere you are. And the Holy Spirit is guiding and moving you, directing you, consoling you, comforting you, yes, even uh, uh, correcting you. So I'm talking to you Christians who are the temples of the Holy Spirit. Every one of you who is a real Christ follower and the Holy Spirit dwells in you, you have three roles to play in conclusion of this entire series, and that is the Christian who is the priest, the Christian who is the prophet, and the Christian who is the king. Now, I'm going to change that because we have men and women here, and uh, I'll call it royals. You're, you're a prophet, you're a priest, and you're a royal. And as a Christ follower, you are supposed to live in such a way that the Spirit would guide you to live this out. Now, we saw the kings of Israel, the half-hearted Saul, the whole-hearted David, the wise and the foolish Solomon, kings of the north who lived evil in the eyes of the Lord. Kings of the south who sometimes followed in the ways of the Lord and tore down all things that were evil and others who sinned against God. We looked at the priests of Israel and taking a look at Eli who was negligent in his duties as a priest before God in the temple. His sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who were doing horrid things and sexual things and uh, horrific things within the temple. We saw the priests who were uh, not from the family of Aaron and Levi in the northern kingdom who tried to supplant what God had already established, and they were condemned for it because they were not assigned by God for the task of being a priest or a Levi. 
We looked at the prophets of the Old Testament, such as Samuel, who served as judge and as priest and as prophet. We looked at Elijah and Elisha, how they heard the Word of God. They spoke the Word of God. Miracles took place in the name of God. We looked at Nathan and Gad, who were in the courts of kings and gave advice and wisdom and counsel from God to those kings. Men and women, schools of prophets who spoke for the Lord. We saw the distinction between the written prophets of old and the oral prophets of old. We saw the work of the prophet and the role of the prophet, whether it be the office or the motivational gift or the manifestation gift. We looked at all of these things to come today to look at you, one and all, as a Christian in how you are living out the role that God calls you to be a prophet and a priest and a royal. Let's first conclude the entire conversation on prophecy. The Christian, the prophet. Now, if you recall, in the days gone by, we drew a distinction between those who wrote the prophecies of God, and they are canonized in the Scripture, and those who are moved by God to speak the words of God. So we concluded those who were gifted as prophets or moved by the Spirit to bring a prophecy would hear from God and speak the words of God. Now, we have to think about this because that can be a little bit scary. And last week we dove into it pretty hard, but I wanted to conclude it by talking about the way we test prophecy. Scripture is clear that every believer should seek out and pursue prophecy because it edifies the body. It exhorts the body. It consoles those who need comforted. It's the Holy Spirit working in you to bring what is needed in the moment as He will and as He wants. But there are six ways that we as a congregation should test the prophets in our midst who bring a word. Sometimes congregationally, sometimes individually, sometimes it's a, a, a following up and being confirmational, and sometimes it's directional. We see it all. But we have to be able to weigh and test those prophecies and the prophet. First, we have to test the content of the prophecy. What's being said? Is it good? Uh, if we strain it out, or we, do we have to ignore parts that are, aren't beneficial? How do we have to discern it all? Is the prophecy confirming something that God's already doing in the person's life or in the fellowship? Does it flow with what the, is being taught in the Scriptures? And that goes to the second way to test it. Does it align with Scriptures? If anybody gives you a word or something comes to the, word that, uh, to the church that does not align with the text already says, it's not of God. It has to align with the authoritative, canonized, written Word of God. It can't go against it. Revelation 22, 18 through 19 talks about this, that uh, uh, it, doesn't, it shouldn't add to Scripture. It shouldn't conflict with Scripture. So we have to be careful to immediately throw it out, but we have to interpret it through Scripture. I mean, if they say, well, I want you to go to Macedonia, well, that's scriptural, but it may not be what God wants for you said, hey, uh, you've been dispersed, and you're supposed to be, you're, you're called to Galatia. See, Galatia's in the Bible. Well, that's not sufficient, but it has to align with Scripture. It also has to uh, be tested by discerning its benefits. Is it beneficial? See, the Scripture says that prophecy edifies, it exhorts, and it consoles. So is it doing any good? A lot of times people come and just give a harsh word, a hard word. We look through the prophets, don't you recall that every time the Lord told the nation of Israel, north and south, through His prophets, that if they didn't do something right, they'd be in trouble? But He always married it with, if you follow me, if you come to me, I've got mercy abounding for you. I'll bring you to myself. You will be redeemed. You'll be restored. All will be good. You'll be blessed. Always blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. He never comes with a message of harshness without an opportunity for redemption. Does it have benefits? We test the spirit of prophecy. This has to do with the individual themselves. The spirit of the prophecy in John 10 talks about it bringing conviction, not condemnation. Someone brings a word and you feel an oppressive spirit, a heaviness on you that's weighing you down, the weight of the sin is uh, oppressing you, that is not of God. The Holy Spirit speaks to you and convicts you, which lifts your head. It brings hope to you that you can come out of this sin. 
there's a big spirit difference of one who is condemning and one who is convicting. And you know what I'm talking about when it comes to that spirit. When you've had to bring correction to somebody and you're hoping to bring it in a way that's going to be received. And sometimes you bring it and you're so upset, you bring it and say, you've got to change this, bop, 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 bop. And it's like a condemning blanket that's weighing down on somebody. And your heart breaks and you resent it and your fight and flight comes up and then you throw yourself back into the fray and you have a war going on because the spirit was one of contention. But we have to test the prophecy and test the spirit of the prophecy. Is it convicting? Is it calling you out of the mire, out of the darkness? It's lifting you up before the God that you need to look, your, look upon and His face shines upon you and you are drawn to Him once again. That's the spirit of prophecy. Yes, you have to test the prophet. I have a question for anybody who might be using the gift of prophecy. If you're out there, how many of you are sinless? None. How many individuals in the Scripture other than Christ were sinless? None. You mean Elijah, the man of God, sinned? Yeah. Only once in his life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was perfect in every way, but boy, he blew it just one time. (laughs) No, we all know that's not true. The human nature wars against us, and the flesh is always compelling us to do wrong, and only when we walk in the Spirit do we have victory over that flesh. So all of us are sinners. Saying that, a sinner can give a prophetic word? Yeah, a sinner can give a prophetic word. A donkey can give a prophetic word. So when you say, well, hey, that guy's not really walking the way I thought they should be walking with Christ, how should I listen to them? It's only one measurement to test the prophecy is testing the prophet. They should be a person who's striving to walk with God. They should be someone who is uh, walking in the Holy Spirit. We have to teach on the topic that there are sometimes wolves and sheep's clothing in our midst, and we have to be aware of that. We understand that good trees bear good fruit, and so when you have a bad tree trying to produce good fruit, you have to step back and say, I need to weigh this a little heavier, because your walk is not showing what God wants you to say. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect, but we can tell if you're striving for God or not. And the church will weigh that and say, you know what, I don't see you walking with God at all. I have to really put your message on the sideline because I don't know if you're hearing from God. I certainly know I would hear from God more than you would hear from God if you're walking in sin all of your life. (laughs) He can talk to me. He can talk to others. You have to test the accuracy of prophecy. Does it happen? (laughs) Does it come true? Um. What happens if the prophet is kind of inaccurate? He gets most of it right, but not all of it right. Do we take him outside and excommunicate him from the church? The lady speaks a prophetic word, and it's about 75% right. Are they false prophets? Remember that the prophet also is used by God, but they're using their own personalities, and sometimes our interpretation of what we hear is not completely right. God's word is true, but our interpretation of it isn't quite right. Agabus shows this in Acts 22, when he gets a word from the Lord for Paul, and he shares to Paul he's going to be going, be bound by the Jews and presented to the Romans, and that wasn't quite how it happened. I imagine he saw an image of Paul bound with Jews and Gentiles there, and he interpreted one versus the other, and it's not the way it happened. He was right, but not in every detail. Was he a false prophet? The answer is no. So we have to learn how to discern those who are gifted by this spirit for prophecy and how, what's being said and being used by God. Now, here's the attitude that we all have to have when we test this and even look at it. First of all, we have to be sincere about what we're trying to, we're trying to hear from God here. We're sincerely wanting to hear from God, and so we don't just shut it out and, dis, and put disdain upon it because we're supposed to be pursuing it and seeking it, but when it happens, we have to sincerely listen and test it by Scripture and by the Spirit. We have to test it with love. All of the things that Paul talks about when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit is couched right in the middle with 1 Corinthians 13 and talking about you can do it all, but if you haven't got love, it's worthless. Now, some people would say, look, love is everything and everything else has gone away. That's not what Paul was saying. He's saying, as you apply these things, love has to be dominant. Love has to be present. 
because they in the world will know you are my followers by your love. You have to test the prophecy with a gracious heart. Lord, I'm grateful for what you might want to speak to us today. When I come into the pulpit every week, I say, Lord, would you guide me today? I've worked hard on your message. Help me to bring forth your word in a right way, to handle it appropriately, that my doctrine will be your doctrine, as true as it can be according to Scripture. Help me not to get myself in the way. I often pray a prayer that I heard my uncle pray many times. Hide me behind the cross, Lord God, that you, Christ, might shine and I might hide. That you don't look at Dave Foster, but you look at the words of the Scripture as the Spirit ignites them in your hearts. That's my prayer for you every Sunday. I'm grateful for the privilege of speaking it and sharing it. I ask God to bless it always. So as you deal with being a prophet, you have to be open to listening to God. I'm available, God. I'm open to being used by you. Lord, I pray that your spirit would whisper in the backs of our minds when we're meeting with people and friends, as we're going different places, help me, Lord God, to be aware that my role here is to be a messenger of the Savior in this moment. The temple of the Holy Spirit is present where I'm at. And Lord God, let me be a prophet in their midst that you have a word of encouragement, of edification, of consoling, of care, of growth for the people I'm around, be they Christian or be they pagan. You, Christian, are called to be a prophet in the midst of the world. Hear from God. Speak from God. I want to talk to you followers of Christ, Christians, as your role as a priest. We understand by looking at the book of Hebrews that Jesus Christ, in His one sacrifice for all, became as the high priest for all, so that we might come before God through Christ. We look back at the Old Testament, at the sacrificial system, and the Holy of Holies, and the day of Yom Kippur, where the high priest would take that sacrifice and pour it out and bring that into the Holy of Holies, where he alone could go once a year to call on God for the forgiveness of the sins of the people. And in that moment, the Shekinah glory of God would come down, hit the Ark of the Covenant, sit in the, the mercy seat between the cherubim, and the atonement of God would be upon the people of Israel. When Christ died on the cross, the Scriptures say that in that moment, the veil in the temple, that veil that separated the people from their God that only one man could do, it tore in half so that Christ became the high priest for you and I to come before God any time, all the time, calling on Him to be in relationship with Him because the sacrifice was paid. There is one high priest. It is Jesus. So, who are we? Any priests in the house? I know uh, today is uh, Arminian versus uh, Calvinist day. It's a big joke online, and every once a year people uh, argue over uh, Calvinism and Arminianism and free will versus predestination. And a lot of times we think about this, we just had the 500 and some odd year uh, celebration of Reformation, so I ask priests, and of course everybody thinks Catholic priests, and I'm not a Catholic, and I'm not a priest, so I don't raise my hand happens all the time, but are you not aware that Jesus calls you priests? The Scriptures call you priests. Take a look at 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 9. We are going to be going into a series coming up the, later on this summer uh, in a couple of weeks, starting going over 1 and 2 Peter, 1 and 2 and 3 John, and the book of Jude. So we'll hit this passage again in several weeks. But let's read it together here. Look at the uh, display on the wall or there in your Bibles. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Now, once you were not His people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
We take a look at this passage and Peter is saying, God has chosen you, he has picked you, and he has called you to be a royal priesthood. Yes, you are priests. So what is the role of a priest? In light of his mercy, he says, you've received his mercy. So it says, declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness. We can go back to Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, and it says, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, and it goes on. But right there the Lord says, I am going to make you a kingdom of priests. Now some translation says, you will be kings and priests, and we'll look at that in a moment. But you are called to be a priest. The first role of a priest is to bring praises. When someone goes and sees a God person, a man of God or a woman of God, you expect them to speak highly on God. You expect them to be talking about God things, good things. You expect them to bring life and hope. And that's why, as a world, we're aghast when someone who claims to be a person of God does something so horrific. How could that happen? And they should rightly be judged by that. Because a priest who serves the Lord should be declaring the praises of God. But also says, we know, priests bring sacrifices, don't they? You don't get a priest without a sacrifice in the Old Testament. The priest brought sacrifices. Well, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, give us a little light in this. I don't have the slide up there, but I want to uh, read it for you. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it's something that you probably have already heard and know this passage by, by, by heart, but uh, I'll read it. So I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I call on you. He says that you didn't have mercy, but now you have mercy. In light of that mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So as we think about this sacrifice that you're called to live out, this talks about your body. Where do you take your body? Where do you find the temple of the Holy Spirit in your day-to-day life? Who do you spend time with with your body? What kind of population are you engaged with on a regular basis? Heathen, pagan, ungodly? How do you spend your days? Or is it a sacrifice to the Lord? Our whole life is to be there for God. This is our reasonable service. This is the way we worship. So you priests, every one of you, male and female, you are to declare the glory of God and the praises of God and to give your life every minute of it and lay it before the throne and say, I'm yours, sacrificed. Use me. I'll hold nothing back, nothing of self. I'm not going to take off the garment of Christ and hang it up until nice Sunday morning at 11 o'clock when I show up and go off and live like the world. I'm not going to do that. How can we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? God forbid. So as a priest, we offer ourselves as a sacrifice before God day and night. You are priests. So my prayer for you as you go through life as a priest is all, the, all day long you're looking and saying, glory to God. Thank you, God, for that. I'm so grateful, God, for this. Oh, I'm sorry you're going through that. I'm going to pray for you that God might bless you in your life and, and, and build strength in your life. And you speak from the heart of God. You're a priest. Now, the last thing I'll speak about today, Christian, those of you who have been redeemed, those of you who are in Christ, those of you who are Christ followers, you are royals. You are kings and you are queens, and you're called to have dominion and to reign. Now, 
I know it's difficult sometimes for a Christian to even consider themselves a priest, let alone a king or a queen. We have such a low opinion of ourselves. We beat down ourselves all the time because the enemy wants to condemn you of your sinful ways. But you're not perfect. You strive for the things of the Spirit. You strive to be holy. But you're not holy without the Holy Spirit. And the enemy wants to point a finger at every area that your flesh grabs a hold of you, even for an instant, and say, you're unworthy. Who do you think you are to be a prophet or a priest, let alone a royal? That same verse in 1 Peter chapter 2 says, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood. That word talks about kingdom but it also is used in sovereignty, in power, in dominion, in authority and situations. It's used for kings and kingdoms. So it can be rightly said, you are kings who are priests. You are royals who are priests. We can look at Revelation chapter 1 and even bring more clarity to, clarity to it. It says, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, has made us to be a kingdom and priests uh, to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. The literal standard version says that he also made us kings and priests, because that Greek word can be kingdom, but it can also be the person, the royal, the power, the dominion. This is not something I'm trying to parse words with. It's very clear that the Bible says we are co-heirs with Christ, that He rules over all things. Isaiah is clear about that, and that we are co-heirs and we reign with Him. But where do we reign? In what areas should we as kings and queens reign in our life? The Bible gives a lot of things. I'm going to mention some of them today. Royals are supposed to reign in life. He came to give us life abundant, that His joy might be complete in us. It says in Romans 5, 17, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. You say, well, I'm not reigning in life. I'm a victim in life. I'm barely scratching through life. The Bible says you are to pick up the mantle of prince, princess, king, queen, and in Christ because of his redemption, his adoption of you into the royal household of God, that you live as a princess, you live as a prince, you live as a king, you live as a queen, and you reign in your life. Take a hold of it. Step into it. See, the enemy wants to rob and steal, to kill, to destroy. And if he can do that in your head, he's got you. But Christian, you're not just a prophet and you're not just a priest, but you are a royal. Stand up. You don't see royals cowering in the background. They walk in with presence, not arrogance. But they have a space that's been given to them, the authority that is theirs to take. We're called to reign over sin. Look at Romans 6, 14. It says this, believe it or not, maybe a verse you might have missed. I hope you haven't taken a black marker and marked this verse out as if it doesn't apply. It does apply. We're not canceling any verses in the Scripture according to our whims. For sin will have no dominion over you. Why? Since you're not under law, but you're under grace. His grace moving in you. His Spirit dwelling in you. You can take a hold of the thoughts and wrestle them and shake them into obedience unto Christ. You can, but maybe you choose not to. And maybe you choose not to because you felt like you didn't have the authority to. You don't have the walk to. You don't have the sanctification for. You haven't got the, the holiness that you seem to think there's some pious uh, aura around someone. It is not that. You and you and you and you, if you've given your life to Christ, you can shake the sin out of your life by bringing your thoughts into obedience. 
because Christ has given you the authority to do so. See, well, I can't get rid of my sin. No, he forgave you your sin, and he gave you the power to defeat sin. Romans is all about the spirit warring with the flesh. But you play a part in it. The spirit doesn't sweep through and clean you out. He convicts you. He calls you to change, to offer your life as a sacrifice. It says, do not conform to the ways of this world, the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the word of God. Royals reign over sin. The royals reign over the enemy. I remember coaching Little League many years ago. And I had gone to the coaches thing and saw the kids and we did all the drafting. And I knew the talent out there. I knew what we had. We worked really hard as dads and coaches to develop these kids. And they did good. But I knew there was another team out there that we wouldn't play till the end of the season and they were excellent. I know they drafted all the athletes, man. They got a bunch of serious athletes that might go play high school ball, select ball. In the back of my mind, I'm dreading the day that we have to play that team. No, I was encouraging. We all did good. Trained up all the boys. And I never shared this to them. But I could see in them the same trepidation as we went through the brackets and knew that probably if we did well, in the very final game, would face that team. And that's exactly what happened. Our guys played great. They made all kinds of wonderful plays. They hit well. They were playing really well. And they were cheering. They had a positive spirit. I remember that. I got the trophy in my, oh, I gave it up, didn't I? We won. Yes, we won. But I have the trophy in my office and the ball signed by those boys. It's very precious to me. But we went to that. I had to really think about this, and before that game, I could see it in their eyes, and I said, look at yourselves, guys. Did you see how you played this entire bracket? Did you see how you hit, how you ran, how you caught? That's you. Don't think about them. You be you. You own your space. You control the plate. Take a hold of it. And they did. Close game, but we came back and won it. Just on a side note, <laughs> I give credit to God on that because he told me, he said, Dave, walk humbly in this moment. And I was a little bit prideful in that I was walking humbly and I knew the other coach was the most arrogant guy he'd ever met in his life. And I was saying, Lord, if you're true, if you're God, a pride goes before a fall. See his pride, Lord God. <laughs> That was not right to do, but I did it. <laughs> so I spoke good things to the kids, and in the back of my heart, I was saying, shut that guy down. Through the game, I just saw his anger rise up and the heat of it, yelling at his kids. And I was saying, Lord, protect those boys from that man's anger. He did not know how to lose. It was a moment for God to teach them how to lose. It's also a moment for God to teach us how to win. You can go up against giants. God's really good at helping his kids face giants. It's not just a baseball team you might be facing. You might be facing a huge struggle in your life where you're trying to get victory over a stronghold. And it has owned you for your entire life. It's a giant to you. Don't be afraid, Royal. You're called to have dominion over that. You might be facing serious health problems, and you have no control over that storm in your life. Stand in it. Step in it. God will guide you through it, whether it's heaven or whether it's healing. Be a royal. You're God's kids. This last area to, for royals is to reign over kingdoms. See, up until this point, I've talked about how we're to reign over our own lives in the power of the Holy Spirit and draw it in and what we're to do individually. This particular calling goes throughout the entire Scripture about how we're to function in society. And I think that the church has walked away from this calling. 
And the church has walked away from being a part of how this is lived out. Royals reign over kingdoms. Even when it's a godless kingdom. We can see in the days of old that a young boy who had visions and dreams was abused by his brothers and sold by his brothers and sent into captivity to be a servant and was falsely accused and found himself in prison. Oh, what a life for a young man who loved God. And yet out of that place the word came to the highest throne in the land and Joseph was risen to the second most powerful seat in all of Egypt. A young man, his friends, growing up, loving God in Jerusalem. When Babylon comes through, and ta- sweeps through the north, sweeps through the south, and takes all the young men into captivity. Now they're slaves, they're servants. They're thrown into a training camp of how to be servants to others, slaves, if you wouldn't mind, because they were faithful to God. God looked at him and said, I'm going to bring you to a place. And Daniel was picked out of the midst, and he became the advisor to rulers. Three young men who would not bow, changed the heart of an emperor who afterwards declared, serve the Lord God of Israel. He submitted himself when he thought he was the king of kings. Royals are meant to reign over kingdoms. Look at Daniel 7.27. It says, the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be everlasting, and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. Yes, He's the King. He's the King of kings. But you and I are going to reign, and not just reign in the millennium. We're to reign now. How? There are ways to take back a country from its lunacy, one of which is men and women of God running for office. Didn't think I'd go political. Running for office. I don't care if you run as a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent or a Libertarian. Run for office. Well, I'm not good that way. And not only that, I don't want to go through the vetting process and all that. Guess what? David was king. He was an adulterer and a murderer. But he was repentant. Saul Hood st- stood and held the garments of Stephen while he was stoned to death to the point that Christians were afraid to be around Saul because he was a murderer. God knocked him off a horse and turned him around to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Run for office. Make policy. Don't be subject to the policy. Run for school board. You want to deal with what's being taught to kids? Run for school board. Superintendent of schools. Run for council offices. You don't have to be Bible thumping every time in there, but you can stand for godly things and stand for righteous actions. Now say, well, I'm not called to go for office. Okay, how about voting? If the Christian vote would come together in agreement over things that are straight up biblical, they would win every election in every office held in every county and city in the land. It's true. But we're divided. And this is not where my message was going to go, but it's where it's landed. (laughs) Because when it comes to how you have dominion over the land, you don't have to be subject to the foolishness because we live in an area where people get to vote and change things. And the only problem is Christians don't do it. 
This is not Sanctity of Life Sunday, but I'll tell you what, I believe in sanctity of life. And we can have all the conversations in the world about caring for the poor, helping the mother, bringing better adoption policies, and helping systems be in such a place that that child's not born into a horrible situation. But throughout all of history, children were born into horrible situations. We can have that conversation, and we should. Every Christian should stand for reforms that make it better for humanity. We should. It doesn't change this side of the equation that God formed that child in the mother's womb. If the Christians would read the text, own the text, and not get blended in some idea that says, hey, we don't care about the mother if we vote for this. Let me tell you, that's a human life. It's a God-ordained life, and it's taken. And if Christians would just wrap themselves around that, we would rule this country. Just that one issue. There are a lot of others. A lot of others. If evangelical Christians would even halfway think about reforms of social justice to care for every citizen, whether they are of God or not of God, that would make a big difference. But we can't get our head around that. I have a hard time talking to evangelicals, which I am one, who have any ideas about helping the homeless. They just say, I can't stand the homeless. Well, what are you going to do about it? Well, I think they should be swept and gotten rid of. Okay, I hope God doesn't sweep me away when I'm doing wrong and having a hard time. You see how the enemy has divided us so that he himself can rule over a land, and now we're in a place where lies are taught as truth, where evil is purported as good, and you're supposed to buy in, and if you don't buy in, you better shut up. That's where we're at. Why? Because we have not lived as kings and queens. We feel we're subjects. Yes, we're subject to the king of kings, but we are supposed to have dominion on this earth, not walk away from it. Yes, Christian, you're supposed to hear from God and speak the words of God everywhere you go as a prophet of God. Yes, Christian, you're supposed to sing the praises of God in a world of darkness that they might be brought up to a place of light. And live your life as a sacrifice unto Him. And yes, Christian, you're supposed to take a hold of things and rein in the stuff that's destroying you and live a life that's having an impact in society so that others might be blessed by godly actions from you. That's our calling. That's our calling. That's my challenge to you today is to bring it to a close. Hear and speak the words of God, prophet. Offer yourselves as a sacrifice and offer up praises to God, priest. Take dominion over the areas of your life that want to bind you and engage in the care of the needs of the people. I'll say locally, regionally, nationally, and globally. Take dominion, royals. Would you pray with me? Now, some of you, this message didn't even apply to you because you're not even in Christ. You're not a co-heir with Christ. You haven't given your heart to God. And you look at it from outside saying, man, I wish Christians would behave that way, in the right way with love. But right now the Holy Spirit's speaking to you and saying, I'm calling you to this. I want you to come and walk with me. I want you to be adopted into the family of God. Right now, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and saying, give your life to Jesus. He died for you. He forgive your sins if you give your heart to Him. Choose Him today. Ask Him to forgive you, to adopt you. Will you do that today, whether you're here in this room or watching online? Just pray, Lord, forgive me. I give my life to you. Help me to serve you, live for you. Holy Spirit, come into me. Do all the things that change me into who you want me to be. Amen.
Now, if you're a family of God, if you're a follower of Christ, you got to stop cowering. You can't ignore this. You're hiding from your calling. You're afraid of your own calling. By the Holy Spirit, I pray His strength upon you today that ignites something in you that you would see yourself as the priest you're called to be, as the prophet of God where your words are the words of God in the lives of people who need it so desperately, as a royal standing tall, not in your own ability, but in the power and the authority that's been granted to you as a child of God. We were called to take dominion even from the time of Adam, and we lost that privilege over sin. But it did not mean that we were to neglect the things that God had called us to. So would you stand up in your faith? Would you be strong in your faith? You say, Lord, I don't, haven't got the faith for this. i got a lot of questions. My faith is tiny. The Bible says it's okay. A small faith will be sufficient. The disciples said, Lord, we have faith, but increase our faith. We believe, but help our unbelief. You're, you're in good company here. Pray that God expands your faith and your understanding of who He is and who you are in Him. Step up. Step out. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, on this hot July day, I pray that as you go out and about, the Lord will bless you, but more so that you'll bless Him. Bless Him with all your words, with all your thoughts, and uh, be a blessing unto others. Um, Next week, I'm going to be gone. Pastor Jeff Hunley from the Hallows is going to be bringing the message. A great guy great servant of the Lord. The Hallows is one of our partner churches. They meet at 9 o'clock in the morning prior to our service. I really want you to come out and hear the word that God's given to Jeff for the congregation. They've been blessed by you, Rock of Hope, as all of our partners have. And uh, I like to have the partner pastors come in and share so you can hear their hearts as well, get to know some of the leaders within the other congregations. Um, there in the back, there are, is a means for you to drop in your envelopes, church, for your tithe and offering. Thank you again for your faithful generosity. This is last week in our elders meeting, we were looking over the finances, and we're just, at this point, not even in shock, we're just in awe of God's faithfulness, continued faithfulness through you, the congregation, in what He's called us to do here at Rock of Hope. And so, God bless you, church, for your generosity, and for those of you who are giving online, thank you as well. There's an address up there you can send the money to. If you can also, if you'd like to, in your own bank thing, you can actually put us on your uh, um, um, online banking and make payments that way or make a gift that way, I should say. So God bless you for that. Church, would you stand with us? Uh, middle of July, we got a while, ways to go. Pray God blessing. Yes, uh, Wanda. I do want to announce the partner picnic. That's coming up, isn't it? First Saturday of August, everybody, that's just a couple of weeks away, first Saturday of August, we have all of our partners coming out to our North Campus. We'll have a great time for kids, for everybody, all the different nationalities. We've got 10 different nationalities represented in coming, and uh, uh, we're very excited about all of them. They'll be bringing food and cultural music, and it'll be a lot of fun. That's the first Saturday of August at our North Campus. Please be there and and, uh, bring others with you. Okay, God bless you.